climate change. Solar cycles are 11, 80 and 200 years long. We've seen the 11 year cycle very clearly in the charts we've seen. The sun caused today's warming. Today's warming is normal, not unusual. Today's warming will end soon. So how then do we distinguish natural from anthropogenic warming? We have to find a fingerprint of anthropogenic warming which would not occur if there were um, solar or ocean warming causing the change in temperature. Right. Well, we've already seen that temperature doesn't track CO2 concentration at all well in recent times. So let's see if we can find a good match. Now here there is a good match and this is, uh, here's your temperature anomalies which we saw before up there. Now tracking them really quite nicely together are tropical outgoing long wave radiation. Now why is that likely to be a sensible result? Answer, because the sun is incident upon the tropics directly, its azimuth angle is 90 degrees, it comes straight down into the tropics and most heating therefore as a matter of fact occurs in the tropics. And the atmosphere is like a giant engine which transports heat away from the tropics to northern uh, latitudes and to some extent to southern latitudes. So you would expect that if there was going to be any correlation between global temperature anomalies here and any other outgoing long wave radiation anomaly, you'd be most likely to find it in the tropics. And it's in the tropics, therefore, that we need to look for our hotspot. So let's look for it. Here from IPCC 2007 are the different climate forcings which uh, they have modelled. There's a notable omission which we'll come to in a moment, but solar forcing, a fairly bland effect, volcanic ditto, anthropogenic ozone forcing, not much to that, likewise aerosol forcing. But here is an extraordinary picture quite unlike any of the others. Why? This is anthropogenic greenhouse gas forcing. And if you combine all these five forcings together and call them all forcings, it is that which predominates. You get this same pattern again. And here you have latitude across the bottom and altitude in the atmosphere measured in um, hectopascals up on this side. So you've got in the tropics, which is the area we said we needed to look at, you've got this signature effect of global warming that is predicted in the models. Now let's have a look at just one of several records I could give you of actual measurements of temperature. Again, we got uh, the latitude down here and the altitude up here. That's where this hot spot is, or rather, is not. And practically all the records of tropospheric temperatures in the tropics do not show this tropical hot spot at all. And the ones that do, they show no more than just a little flicker above the ground temperatures and nothing more than that. So what do we infer from this? We infer that there may be a very small effect from extra CO2 in the atmosphere, but it cannot be anything like as big as the models are predicting. So we now move on then to why are the models getting things wrong and predicting disaster? Here is one reason why models fail. Now in mathematics you can often find absolute proof. Here is a proof without words by me of, I don't say it's original, but I think it's by me, of um, Pythagoras' theorem. Here you have an irregular pentagon and it contains within it either the squares of the two short sides and two of the right triangles we're looking at, or it contains the square on the hypotenuse and two triangles. That is a, a, an absolute, rigorous, complete proof uh, of Pythagoras' theorem. Now what the heck's Pythagoras' theorem got to do with global warming? Well it's this, that in the physical sciences generally and in particular in something like climate science where the data we have are largely inadequate, there just isn't enough of it, you can't make absolute proofs most of the time. Here is a, a formidable atmospheric physicist from Japan, Sunichi Akasofu. No supercomputer, no matter how powerful, is able to prove definitively a simplistic hypothesis that says the greenhouse effect is responsible for warming. It can't be done. So we now have to look at another equation. There we are, this one you will all have uh, known about. This is Einstein's equation. And now let's just magic it away and put another equation in its place. Broadly similar. You've still got radiant energy in watts per square meter on the left, but now you have emissivity, you have a constant, and you have temperature to the power of 4. Now this is the Stefan Boltzmann equation. 
And the importance of this equation is that it tells you that there is a formula that links the extra radiant energy that might arise from radiative forcings, like putting more CO2 in the atmosphere, and temperature. But you notice that the temperature is to the fourth power, which means that if you have uh, a, 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 an increase in radiant energy, the increase in temperature is actually going to be very small. And as a result, we can now look at a table of the different values for how much we might expect temperature to change um, that are available in the scientific literature. And you'll see it's a very huge range. Here's my own calculation, and we get 1.6 degrees Celsius as the change in temperature for a doubling of CO2. Now, the IPCC says 3 Celsius, about twice what I make it to be. And one of the things that's been said to me over and over again by the conformists is, oh yes, but the science of this has been settled for a hundred years. It was Arrhenius who did the first calculations in his paper of 1896, and he said it was somewhere between 4 and 8 Celsius for a doubling of CO2, and the Stern Report says 11, and so how dare you say only 1.6? But you see, I don't just read English, I also read German. And in 1906, Arrhenius, having the Stefan Boltzmann equation available to him, which he hadn't quite got hold of in his first paper, recalculated everything. And he came to the same conclusion as I had, that for a doubling of CO2 concentration, you will get 1.6 Celsius of temperature change. And this is the range of temperature uh, that is, is there. So why so wide a range? Maybe because we really don't know how much CO2 there is effect uh, on temperature. And we're now going to look at some of the constraints that limit the effect which CO2 can have. First of all, here is its percentage by volume in the atmosphere. It did occupy 0.03% of the atmosphere in 1750. It now occupies getting on for 0.04%, and that gives you a change of one ten thousandth part of the atmosphere more now than in 1750 is occupied by CO2. Now that, in itself, is a rather simplistic analysis, so we're going to go a little further. The IPCC has constantly rethought how much it thinks CO2 influences um, temperature. And in that forcing formula that I showed you before, the coefficient z, it was 6.4 in 1995, it was 5.35 in 2001. They no longer publish it, but I've managed to calculate it from the data they have provided. It's 5.27 now. So it's come down by nearly 20% in just 12 years. Equivalent, if you like, to a 20% reduction in the entire greenhouse gas emissions of the world in only 12 years. So the consensus does not agree with itself. And the most extraordinary thing is that the IPCC, notwithstanding these reductions and many other reductions I could point to, has maintained its best central estimate of climate sensitivity at 3 degrees Celsius in response to a doubling of CO2 throughout. None of this has been recalculated properly. I don't think we're getting this, this honest science. So if we move quickly on then to the next slide, here we get uh, a rather prodigious mismatch again uh, between CO2 concentration, which is the black line, and temperature con concentration, which is the blue line, going right back to almost 600,000 years into the past. And here we had almost 7,000 uh, parts per million of CO2 compared with 385 or thereby today, 7,000 then, temperature managed to, to get up to about 22 Celsius and has never really gone much higher than that at any time over the past half billion years, as best it can be reconstructed. There are, of course, again, difficulties going that, that far and getting accurate results, but the IPCC itself says that in the Cambrian, uh, carbon dioxide certainly went up, uh, in its opinion, to around 6,000 parts per million, so this is not a controversial graph. What it is controversial is that, again, it doesn't show a terribly good link between the two. And it doesn't show, in particular, the runaway climate change uh, when we had a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that the Tory party has written about in one of the most scientifically illiterate considerations of climate change that I've ever had the misfortune to have to read. So we then go on to look at this logarithmic effect that the first 20 parts per million of CO2 have a very much greater effect, not probably quite as much greater as is shown here, than all the, the, the remaining 400 that follow it. So every time we put more CO2 in the atmosphere, it has less effect than it had before. 
Then we come on to, to a problem of how long does it stay in the 